Greetings, my name is Kevin Ruddick and I welcome you to Conversations from the Hot Box. Conversations from the Hot Box are topics, issues, or conversations myself and others of various ages, races, and backgrounds engage in while we're in the song at the gym. And my sharing is from a biblical Christian perspective for your consideration. Now, if that offends you, then please, please don't listen. Because the goal is not to offend or argue, but communicate thoughts for your consideration in healthy, respectful debate. Today's conversation addresses the topic of the bride of Christ. And the conversation was birthed out of uh, us discussing the number of preachers stating that Jesus was coming back soon. And I know soon is a relative term, but I don't think Jesus is coming back soon because scripture states what he will be coming back for. In Ephesians chapter five, verses 25 through 27, it states, husbands love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her in order to make her holy and cleansing her with the washing of water by the word so as to present the church to himself in splendor without a spot or wrinkle or anything of the kind. Yes, so that she may be holy and without blemish. What the writer, the Apostle Paul, is expressing here is by the teaching of the word of God and its application, believers prepare themselves to be presented to Christ when he returns. Jesus is coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle, according to scripture. The bride of Christ is a first century metaphor for the church's relationship with Jesus. The bride of Christ metaphor illustrates the relationship between Jesus and the church and Jesus's authority over the church. To be Christ's pure bride requires on the church's part pure and simple devotion. Now, if Jesus is coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle, then I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. But right now, the bride of Christ looks more like the bride of Frankenstein. And let, let, let me share with you where I'm getting this, 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 this analogy from. When I was a student at King University in New Jersey, I took a filmmaking class. In that class, we had two papers I had to complete using two of the classic films we watched during the course of the semester. The two films I chose to do my papers on were Dracula and The Bride of Frankenstein. I chose Dracula because it was very interesting to see how the character was symbolic of the German government at that time. And Dracula symbolized how the government was sucking the lifeblood out of its citizens. Now, regarding the Bride of Frankenstein, I found myself completely engrossed in it. There were so many dynamics of this film that dealt with the uh, social issues of that time. And make no mistake about it, this was a politically charged and conscientious film that dealt with a variety of highly controversial themes and it addressed complex social, racial, gender, as well as sexual issues. Now let's look at some current comparisons between these two brides. The Bride of Frankenstein was created by using the parts from dead bodies. The term dead refers to being a uh, deprived of life, uh, lacking power to move, feel, or respond. To be dead is to be incapable of being stirred emotionally or intellectually, and it refers to being free from any connection to a source. For example, with Adam and Eve sin, they were spiritually disconnected from God, and therefore, according to scripture, they died spiritually because they was disconnected from their source. Most time when anything dead is connected to anything living, death will invade and consume the life. In fact, centuries ago, uh, uh, some Roman emperors were known to inflict the, the punishment of 
binding the dead corpse of a murder victim to the back of the murderer. The decaying dead body would start to decay the living body. And under penalty of death, no one was allowed to remove the body from the condemned individual. Corporately, we should not allow the ways of the world, meaning the dead body parts, uh, 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 to tie itself to the body of Christ, nor should the sins of our past be tied to us individually. The bride of Frankenstein also had an artificial brain that was developed by man in the lab. The brain is a complex organ that controls uh, thought, memory, emotion, uh, 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 touch, smell, uh, all our motor skills, uh, vision, uh, uh, breathing, body temperature, uh, uh, it, it, every process that regulates our body comes through the brain. And all these God-provided functions are dysfunctional in the Bride of Frankenstein. The Bride of Frankenstein was providing a fresh heart from a woman who was murdered by uh, uh, the bride's creator. And the heart, according to the Bible, is part of man's spiritual makeup. It is the place where emotions and desires begin. It is that which drives the will of man towards action. Now, to get people to desire what God desires, then God must, quote, remove the heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh, according to Ezekiel 36, 26. Yet this bride was equipped with a fresh heart of stone. It's called the heart of stone because Jesus said that sins like evil thoughts and sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, uh, deceit, envy, slander, arrogance, foolishness, all of these things originate in the heart of man, according to Mark chapter 7. Today, the bride or the church has a heart problem, and it needs a heart transplant from God. It has let too much of the ways of man and the world to enter in and control and influence. Also, the bride of Frankenstein did not speak. She screamed and she hissed. Her verbal communication consisted of only noise to the listeners, to the hearers. But to herself, she felt, probably felt she was communicating intelligible thoughts and feelings, but to the hearer, it was just noise. It was powerless to produce any change of thought or action in others. When the declaration of the gospel and the word of God is done from a dead place, it's power to give life and transformation and freedom to the hearer is hindered. It's covered by a shadow of death. And in that, the bride of Christ becomes ineffective. The church today has allowed the dead body parts to be connected to her under the concept of social inclusion. Too many churches have allowed the systems, the philosophies, the concepts, the idealisms, and the principles of the world to infiltrate the church. And many of these parts, according to scripture, are dead to God and his kingdom. Now understand that when I say church, I'm talking about those who say they believe and follow the teachings of Jesus Christ, not a building. As such, I'm referring to those who say they stand for truth and order and fairness and love and compassion and forgiveness and honor and respect, just to name a few. But when you say you are a believer and that you stand for and adhere to the principles of the kingdom of God, it's confusing to me and others like me to see and hear you on social media platforms attacking and accusing fellow believers. And the cover for this behavior is righteous indignation. 
an individual's anger a uh, 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 settled indignation opposed to boiling rage or fury is what's referred to as 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 you know indignation but it does not necessarily work God's righteousness, but one is not necessarily promoting the cause of God by his own personal anger or righteous indignation. In Ephesians, uh, let me locate it. In Ephesians uh, chapter four, verses 26 and 27, to find it real quick, verses 26, 27, chapter 4, uh, yeah, it states, be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. <laughs> the Amplified Bible uh, says, uh, when angry, do not sin. Do not ever let your wrath, your exasperation, your fury, your indignation last until the sun goes down. The ideal of verses 26, 27 in Ephesians it, it said that is this. Christians are to exercise a righteous indignation over sin in the midst of the believing community. And going back one verse to verse 25, it, it opens up a restricting of those discussions to those in the body of Christ. You see, when, when, when other believers sin, such people should be gently and quickly confronted and prayerfully restored. In James chapter 20, I mean, chapter 1, verse 20, it states, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And, and Psalms 24, 3 and 4, it's, it's a summary of, of what's known as speech ethics. And the psalm uh, uh, impresses one with the fact that uh, 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 the writer of this particular psalm felt very strongly about the lies and slanders and boastings of the wicked. And it stirred within him righteous indignation. But the people called upon God to awaken and confront the enemy of truth and righteousness. See, their righteous, their, their indignation, uh, 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 it, 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 it went to God. They presented. And today we take on the role of God as opposed to going to God. Or uh, we listen to those who takes on the role of God. And, and, and both are unable to recognize strange fire. We, 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 we used to seek after pleasing God. We used to seek after his anointing and, and his gifts. We used to seek after being pleasing in the sight of God as proclaimers of his divine truth. Now we just seek after likes and subscriptions and followers using the elements of baseless scandals and sensationalism. Elements that are the exact opposite of the principles of God's kingdom. And this is done under the cover of social media entertainment. Remember, Satan is an imitator. He copies the systems and things of God. And in doing so, he has established a kingdom of darkness. And every kingdom has principles. Principles serve as the foundation of how a system functions. The dead body parts represents principles from Satan's kingdom. So in allowing and accepting these parts and connecting them to the church and how it functions, we have created Brides of Frankenstein. In the book of Acts, uh, uh, chapter 6, I believe, uh, verses uh, 8 through 13, it reads, Stephen, full of grace and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freemen 
as it is called, which was uh, free Jewish slaves. The, the Cyrenians, the Alexandrians, and others of those from Asia Minor stood up and argued with Stephen, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he spoke. Then they secretly instigated some men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. They stirred up the people as well as the elders and the scribes. Then they suddenly confronted him, seized him, and brought him before the council. They set up false witnesses who said, this man never stopped saying things against the holy place and the law Moses provided. The elementary principles of this world are the various ways in which man tries to take control of his own life and his destiny. And to be truthful, all of us are born with this basic belief that we can save and satisfy ourselves, whether we want to admit it or not. All of us have this tendency to worship whatever it is we think we need, be it social media likes and subscribers, for example, in order to experience fulfillment, security, and ultimately happiness in life. You know, it's, it's, it's dangerous to follow the false gods of today's American culture. And, and they are, they include rather the, the worship of individuality and entitlement. We've used terms like self-esteem and self-discovery and self-fulfillment and self-expression in order to promote a lifestyle that is centered around doing and living however we want and without the constraints of any absolute authority telling us what's right and what's wrong. Every generation seeks to interpret the church in terms of its own thinking based on its past experiences in religion, culture, philosophy, and even spiritual enlightenment. Absent the teaching of the word of God, these generations, these converts begin to interpret Christianity in the light of their past experiences and understanding of their own concept of God. The world will exert all sorts of pressures to force us to adopt its ways of thinking. But believers, we are not to function like jello and just conform to whatever mold we may be poured into. We don't have to conform. We are to be transformed from within by God, not put together with dead parts by Dr. Frankenstein. So in my opinion, the bride of Christ has a bit more cleaning up to do before Christ comes for her. And how quickly that happens is up to those of us who confess that we are members of the body. What say you? Thank you.